there's nothing more, I think, compelling than a bunch of people, predominantly, frankly, young people, who, you know, excited about a cause and going fully for it. I think that there's nothing like that. Okay, so welcome. It's amazing to have you here. This is actually our fourth virtual installment of Pizza and Politics. And unfortunately, there's no pizza here today. But we just wanted to start off and ask, how do you feel about pineapple pizza? Not good. Uh, I'll have to admit that I am a pizza purist. Uh, it's not just pizza, it's any food. Um, I hate the mixture of sweet with savory. I frankly don't really eat sweet things at all anyway. And so pineapple pizza is a no. Could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit of what, about what inspired you to run for Congress? Totally. Um, yeah. So uh, again, thanks for having me on here. It's funny. I ran for Congress. Um, and one of the first things that happens is that as a challenger to an incumbent, you're not the most welcome person to the political class. But where we were always welcome was um, high schools, middle schools, uh, speaking to students. And it like helped me hone my message and remind you of what's important. Like literally every single week, I probably went to two or three middle schools or high schools to talk about um, what we were doing, which is pretty awesome practice. Anyway, uh, and I guess that's a clunky way of answering your question, which is um, I'm an attorney. I'm a professor at NYU. I worked for the uh, President Obama's uh, campaign in 2008 and again in 2012 and for his White House. Um, and then I ran for Congress in 2018. And part of the reason I ran is because I think that there is a tremendous um, uh, problem in our politics, which is skewed, frankly, towards problems uh, faced by uh, older generations and very little agency and um, help for young people, period. Uh, we're, the, we're the country that spends only 10% of its federal budget on uh, children, on people under the age of 18. That's pretty brutal. If you think about a country that um, spends 90% on on everyone else, it tells you that there is a lack of agency for so many problems facing, um, you know, my generation and, and frankly, your generation. Thank you so much. My question for you is that, as you know, there is a very prominent partisan divide in our country right now. What steps in the future would you take to actively connect people of all political ideologies across your district? Um, so I think one thing that's really important is to remember that you don't just become the representative for the people who voted for you. Um, you know, Donald Trump forgot that. He seems to be the first president who behaves like only the president of the people who voted for him. It's very important that um, once the election is over, your job is to represent everyone and every interest in your district and frankly across the country, because um, these are national policies we're talking about. So I would broach no problem with, with working with and speaking to, let's say Republicans in, in our district in New York City. And I will admit there are very few because um, it's New York City, but, but overall, I think some of the reasons that um, we propose our own new policies around climate change, around uh, family opportunities, things like that was because we um, uh, you know, wanted to see if there were policies that could get bipartisan support. Um, I think a lot of Republicans in Congress would be supportive of more research and development funding for science for vaccines for climate change things like that in a way they may not be of other ways of combating climate change which is not to say that i would you know i don't think that other ways are important i'm it's just saying that like we should also look to try and pass things um that can get bipartisan support um you touched on this earlier but there's recently been a massive focus on race-based injustices and violations of rights how do you take steps to advocate for the protection and the protection of rights of indigenous people and people of color and how did you incorporate that into congressional campaign um so like i said i think i mean we really transformed i mean i marched almost every night uh for the protest we wrote um you know prior to the george floyd protest i had, had written about uh racial disparities in policing and in criminal justice reform and ending mass incarceration and um, moving towards um significantly lower levels of of um, uh, incarcerating people, period, and let alone, you know, obviously people of color um, who are disproportionately affected. So, you know, first things first, we have to, as we said before, you know, take all the resources, so many of the resources we spent on surveilling and policing 
and over-policing and over-incarcerating and shift some of those to creating economic opportunity. Um, by and large, you can't get ahead in this country without, um, not just without an education, but without the opportunity to use that education, jobs and um, education. And you need to fund uh, economic development and opportunity in some of the most um, uh, forgotten or, or left behind parts of our country, which happen to be uh, places where um, significant amounts of, of minorities and indigenous, frankly, indigenous people live. So we've got to really rebalance where we spend so many of our resources. I mean, we've been, we've been sort of shortchanging some communities for the entire history of the United States of America. I'm reading a book right now called Cast, and um, it's just such a shocking and appalling history that we've lived. You would be, I, I was shocked to read this just this morning when I was reading in the morning. Um, 2022 will be the first year that America will have been a non-slave, uh, a, a non-slavery country longer than it has been a slavery country. The idea that that was just some relic of our past, it's half of our past. It's not even half of our past. I mean, it's more than half of our past right now. So there has got to be some massive correction for, um, for, for where we, you know, where, why the, you know, why are the poorest people in this country still, uh, minorities and indigenous people. I mean, there's a legacy there and it's not just going to be done away by one generation of affirmative action or whatever, you know? And I know we are facing some significant blowback for saying things like that. And we saw it last week when a bunch of Confederate flag wielding insurrectionists tried to overturn the will of an election and attack the very seat of American democracy. That's crazy. And yet, it should resolve us even more and even stronger to once and for all stamp out this stain and address systemic racism and injustice in this country. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, just to shift gears a little bit, uh, what advice would you give young people who are perhaps interested in politics or passionate about a social justice issue? It's my favorite type of question. Um, and I would just say, jump in. I mean, uh, my life changed. In 2008, I was in law school. Um, 2007, I was in law school at New York University. And I was so, you know, I would refresh like political blogs and CNN.com every day because I was so enamored with and enthralled by the movement that um, Senator, then Senator Barack Obama was building. I saw, you know, it's thousands of people at rallies across the country. And I thought to myself, I want to be part of that. Shit, I want to be part of that. And so I left law school, much to my parents' dismay, and joined the Obama campaign as an organizer and then um, as an advanced person traveling around the country. And I got to see literally hundreds of thousands of faces, black, white, uh, old, young, you know, Hispanic, whatever, um, in this coalition showing up to believe in something hopeful and positive and inclusive. And I just, it was the best thing I've ever done. Um, and I think I always tell people like, you know, work for a campaign one time in your life because um, though they are full of heartache 50% uh, of the time, heartbreak 50% of the time, um, there's nothing more I think compelling than a bunch of people, predominantly, frankly, young people who flock to campaigns, uh, excited about and, 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 you know, excited about a cause. And going fully for it. I think that there's nothing like that. So I would say just jump in. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a political campaign. It can be any kind of campaign, an issue campaign, a Black Lives Matter campaign, whatever. But like organizing marches and events and talking to people every single day on the street. And I don't mean, I really, really uh, implore you not to, uh, like, I'll admit, like, I hate some parts of politics and campaigning a lot. I hate Twitter. I don't use Twitter. I think it's a toxic place um so i don't even use my own and i log on once every like week and a half to see if i got any messages um if anyone wanted to reach me uh by dm but i, I think that getting out in person which i know is difficult right now um but hopefully by the end of this summer uh getting back out in person and on the street and talking to people at farmers markets and at their homes at their churches and their synagogues is is the most compelling exciting thing i've ever done and you know, not just for my campaign, but on campaigns. 
Why do you think students should take time out of their busy schedules to learn about government? Oh, I, I mean, I think that uh, we all know at this point how important our government can be. If you asked me that question five years ago, uh, you know, you might have been like, sure, it's really an interesting and exciting thing and we can make a lot of positive change because government has the ability to really, really create massive opportunity. But we never really looked at the downside uh, until the last four years where government can also not just not create opportunity, it may be a cancer on society if it's run by the wrong people. And nothing is more, I think, telling than the last few years of how important this is. You don't live in an isolation. You don't live uh, in a, in, on an island somewhere. You're in the United States of America. The American government is there for the taking for anyone who's willing to run for office, do the work of knocking on doors, making phone calls. And then the American experiment, uh, with all the resources behind it, are there to create massive change in this country and in this world. And I think um, there's nothing more important in that case, you know?